Well, this is Current Yield, ladies and gentlemen, Grant's interest rate observer of the air. I am Jim Grant, and uh, with me, as per usual, is uh, Eric Whitehead, who's sitting at the control panel. And directly across from me is Evan Lorenz, the great deputy editor of Grant's. And with us, today's guest, is Rob Arnott, who is uh, needing no introduction. He will nonetheless get one, and not uh, terribly lavish, because that would uh, embarrass uh, our guest. But um, first and foremost, happy Father's Day, Rob. Rob is the father of four. Thank you so much. And he is an mm-hmm. uh, entrepreneur, a scholar, a friend of Grant's, to be sure. I started uh, research affiliates in 2002. Uh, I'm not sure what is the part-time gig. As I count his published essays, they number about 120, say, or, I don't know, like a, a hundred and something, impressively. There are books, to be sure, <laughs> and uh, there is a business to be run and uh, children to be, uh, what's the verb? Managed, directed, watched, I suppose, at, at, after a certain age, one watches. Shaped. Yes, that, that is <laughs> the hopeful approach. Rob, of all the literary credentials, to begin with an author's idea of what's most important, I am so tickled to see, I guess I knew this, but I, I was refreshing myself in, in preparation for this broadcast. I was reminded that you had a fellow co-author several times in the great Peter L. Bernstein, this charming, the late great yeah. Peter Bernstein, a charmer among other things, and a truly accomplished man. Yeah, he was one of my dearest friends and just a towering intellect and a mensch, a wonderful yeah, human yeah, being. Yeah. He was also probably the best writer in, in finance ever. Imagine deciding to write a book on the history of risk and statistical evaluation of risk and saying, I'm going to write that book and it'll be a New York Times bestseller. Yeah, imagine that? No, not only can't I imagine it, if out of sheer professional jealousy, I'm going to deny it ever happened. That's my <laughs> approach to it. <laughs> and I also see that you have a co-author yeah. in uh, Cliff Asness, who doubles as a sparring partner. Yes, yeah. Well, I have a huge regard for his intellect. He and I disagree on some things from time to time, but yeah, well, that's, that's... he's smart, he's savvy, and he's very funny. He is, and he also, not unlike the late Peter Bernstein, and also the very here and present Rob Arnott is an accomplished uh, fellow with uh, subjects and predicates, not just equations. So anyway, so uh, enough of the Mm -hmm. preceding matter. And I I don't know, Evan had this great idea of having you on, Robin, and he came to me with the observation that uh, you are... Uh, bullish on emerging markets in a very big way and with your own money. And uh, this appeals to Mm -hmm. us because it's a a hugely contrary idea now. Could you tell us what exactly you're up to? Sure. Well, I've been quoted in the press as acknowledging that I eat my own cooking and that I uh, have over half of my liquid net worth in emerging markets deep value stocks these days. That's a position built gradually. My first purchase was, I think, 2014. I raised it to about a third in late 2015, and of course, emerging markets value soared in 16. I trimmed the position lightly and came back in when emerging markets went and had yet another bear market. Buying in bear markets is very hard for most people. To me, it's kind of a natural instinct. The thing about the thing about buying bargains is. There's no such thing as a bargain in the absence of fear. So when people say, yeah, it looks cheap, but look at all these problems they've got. Why don't I wait until things settle down and you get more clarity on outlook, then maybe I'll buy. Well, that's the same thing as saying I'll buy when it's no longer a bargain. The other thing about bargains is on the way to becoming a bargain, they've inflicted pain and losses. So... When people experience pain and losses, they say, get me out of here. It's very hard to buy. And a third thing to note about bargains is that narrative for why they really should be cheap and why they're probably going to get cheaper is not some sort of crazy idea. It exists for a reason. There's usually a legitimate risk that what's cheap is going to get cheaper. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been cheap in the first place. And that legitimate risk means you diversify across multiple bets and you diversify across time. You're, you, you have to recognize that contrarian investing, buying what's out of favor and unloved, sometimes is going to go against you for a while. So you have to train yourself to be patient. 
Uh, yeah, and fearless too. That would help. So do you buy these uh, securities one by one, Rob, or do you uh, kind of approach the uh, matter from the top down? I use, I use mutual funds in research affiliates because part of our business is creating indexes, fundamental index, fundamental multi-factor, things like that. To avoid conflicts of interest, we don't allow any of our employees to buy individual stocks. Yeah, those, 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 are, those are the employees though. wind right? up being added to yeah. the index. But Rob, those are the yeah. those are the yeah. those are the employees. What about the guy who runs the place? <laughs> no, I was just kidding. I, I, I think right. the rule applies to me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Rob, you're, you're not buying individual stocks; uh, you're buying mutual funds. But are there certain countries, sectors, or themes that you're trying to buy into? Like, what is the most interesting to you? Well, uh, we developed the idea of fundamental index back in 2004, and fundamental index weights companies not in proportion to their market capitalization which means you're investing in proportion to how popular the company is, in proportion to what its valuation multiple is. And in so doing, you're guaranteed of having too much money in the stocks that are overpriced, that are trading above their eventual valuation. Even though you don't know which companies they are, you're guaranteed of being overweight those companies. If instead you weight companies according to the size of the business, so you take the growth stocks and say, say, thanks for those wonderful gains. I'm going to reweight it down to the economic footprint of the businesses. And the value stocks, the unloved stocks, I'm going to say thank you for the deep discount. Yeah, I know the company's trouble, but it's in the price, so it's not likely to hurt me. So I'm going to reweight it back up. I'm going to top it back up to its economic weight. Now, if you do that, you're downweighting the growth stocks, you're upweighting the value stocks, you do have a stark value tilt relative to the market, but what's cool is it's a dynamic value tilt. So as the market pays a deeper or shallower discount for the out-of-favor value stocks, you're contra-trading against the price moves. Whatever the market most newly loathes, that's what you're buying. Whatever the market most newly loves, that's what you're selling. Okay, so far so good. Now, when it comes to emerging markets, the same rule applies, but with a difference. Emerging markets are trading cheap relative to the world markets, and most particularly relative to U.S. stocks. And within emerging markets, value is trading unusually cheap. The spread between growth and value in emerging markets is the widest ever. Why is that? Well, you've got the Baidu's, the Ten Cents, the Alibaba's of the world, and they're trading right in line with U.S. Fang stocks. Okay, they're expensive by any standard, by any um, valuation metrics you care to use. And yet, the average stock in emerging markets is half off relative to the U.S. Well, that may, must mean that the value stocks are three fourths off, and that's where we are. So, the one of the measures that I love to use is the Schiller P.E. ratio. It's not that it's perfect. It's not that it's flawless. It's not that it uh, always foretells the future. But it does a wonderful job of gauging whether a market is cheap or rich. It's simply the price of a market or a stock relative to the 10-year smooth earnings. Oh, Rob, t taking a step and back on, that, on the, the Schiller ratio, the sure. last 10 years have been notable for a few things. One, we've engaged in a decade of unconventional monetary policy. And two, and a big driver for emerging markets is we've had China basically go on the biggest debt-fueled fixed in asset investment binge in the history of the world, at least as far as we're aware of uh, going back to the pyramids. Do either of these kind of skew the numbers so much that it's not as reliable an indicator as it used to be? Yeah, we hear that a lot. <laughs> Basically, any time the Schiller P.E. suggests caution, critics come out of the woodwork saying, here's why it, it's um, wrong to pay attention to it this time. Now, merit to some of their arguments, as is often the case, narratives usually are built on a foundation of a certain amount of fact. But some of the criticisms are, well, the Schiller P.E. includes the last 10 years, which still includes the global financial crisis when earnings basically evaporated. Do you really want to include that year? Well, the whole point of a Schiller P.E. is to take account of peaks and troughs. So a year from now, we might have the first time in the history of Schiller P.E. where the Schiller P.E. has no recessions in it at all. That actually kind of defeats the purpose of the Schiller P.E. smoothing out peaks and troughs of earnings. As for China, I think if they have embarked on the greatest capital spending 
binge in history, that is likely reflected in their debt burdens, self-evident, and in their valuation multiples, which will reflect the headwinds associated with a debt-financed capital expenditure binge. And so the valuations in China are low by historic standards. When we look at the Schiller P.E. ratio for the U.S., it's 32 times earnings right now. That's expensive. It's been higher than that only once, uh, the peak of the tech bubble, and it's been nearly that high um, only one other time, the 1929 peak. That's not great company to be keeping. Jeremy Grantham wrote a piece about a year and a half ago in which he suggested that just maybe the Schiller P.E., was at a newly sustainable high level. A permanently high plateau, if you will. A a permanently higher structural P.E. ratio because of A, low cost of capital, B, the monopoly dominance of some U.S. companies, notably in the tech arena and the world economy. Well, as you say, as you say, Rob, some of these narratives have, uh, have some factual merit. Hey, speaking of the cost of capital, I'm going to propose a I don't know. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to make bold to make a statement. I'd like you to comment on it. I'm going to say that bonds are the least desirable asset class in the world, major asset classes, and that they are perhaps the greatest imposters insofar as people equate bonds inherently with safety. Now, does this either prong of that assertion ring true to you, or am I just? I don't know. Am I going over the edge? I would agree with what you said. With Um, a caveat, and that is that we have central bankers all over the world making some heroic blunders. And with interest, as long as they continue making these blunders, until you wind up with the debt blossoming out of control, which is happening in some countries, the rates can be sustainably low for a very long time, Japan being a classic example. So Do I think bonds are a bubble when it gets to negative interest rates? Yeah. We wrote a piece a year ago called uh, titled, Yes, It's a Bubble, So What? And I think the most important thing we did in that paper was to offer up a definition for the term bubble that you could use in real time. People say the tech bubble, the Japan bubble, but it's always after the fact. Hardly anyone in 2000 was describing it as a tech bubble. Some, some of us were, but not many. And in 1989, the Japan bubble, people were, very few people were saying that. After the fact, you look back and say, yeah, that was a bubble. Okay, how do you define it in a way that's actionable and useful today? One, if you're using a valuation model, you have to make implausible assumptions to justify current valuations. Two, the average marginal buyer pays no attention to valuation models. So when it comes to negative interest rates, how can you have any valuation model that justifies that? And the marginal buyer of negative interest rate bonds doesn't care about valuation models, doesn't doesn't have a clear picture of what the equilibrium rate ought to be. And so, yeah, negative interest rates are a bubble. Yeah, Tesla, Twitter, Netflix, uh, Zillow are bubbles because you'd have to use implausible growth assumptions to justify the valuation, and the marginal buyer doesn't care. Uh, Cryptocurrency, same thing. So now you have a definition that can be used to define a bubble. Is the U.S. stock market a bubble? No, it's not. It's expensive. You have to use very aggressive growth assumptions to justify current valuations and in order for stocks to have a meaningful risk premium relative to bonds. Are U.S. Treasury bonds a bubble? No, relative to the rest of the world, far from it. Yeah, uh, deep value. In fact, one could even make a bullish case. Sure, deep value. Yeah. Uh, this edition of Current Yield is brought to you in part by a book. Yeah, by my book. Available for pre-order, James Grant's Badgett, The Life and Times of the Greatest Victorian. It is a measure of Grant's talent as a biographer that Badgett appears as scintillating and charismatic as he is reputed to have been in life. Even readers not normally drawn to economic subjects will find themselves enjoying this lively and erudite biography and guide to financial Victoriana. Pre-order now. Yeah, 
Well, John, John, you, you won't stop there, will you? No, I'd like to give All you right. another Go example yep. of this. Yeah. Available for pre-order, James Grant's Badgett, The Life and Times of the Greatest Victorian. This is from Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England and author of The End of Alchemy. The most perceptive and brilliant economic and political writer of his time deserves a biographer of equal literary merit. In James Grant, Walter Badgett has found him. And to pre-order now, visit grantspub.com forward slash Badgett. That's grantspub.com forward slash Badgett. Hey, Rob, you are among yeah. uh, the people we read who look at the yield curve and say that if the curve is inverted, which is to say, if the, not sure which measure you use, let's say that the three month treasury bill versus the 10 year treasury note, if the yield hovers above the yield on the note, for fill in the blank number of days more, that will be a sign almost certain of a looming recession. Now, could you tell us your current thinking on this? And uh, if uh, there are a number of days left that you can share sure. with us, what's the countdown? <laughs> I would moderate that ever so slightly. Firstly, my hero in this arena is Dr. Cam Harvey from Duke. Best of my knowledge, he was the one who originated the yield curve inversion as a signal for recession. And he did it in his 86 PhD dissertation. He identified six recessions after 1950. Six out of six were forecast by the yield curve with an average of about 10 months lead time. There were no false signals. When the yield curve inverted, there was a recession. When there was a recession, there was a yield curve inversion first. Well, that's pretty cool. And subsequent to that, there have been five. How long yeah. do you need uh, the curve to be inverted to actually have it be a signal? And the reason we ask is we uh, look back at the track record, and the 10-3 actually um, inverted for around 90 days in 66. And while growth did slow between 66 and 67 from like 6% to almost 3%, there was no recession until, um, until what was it, December of 69? Three years later. Three years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that case, it was a slowdown, not a recession. But... The way that Cam likes to describe it is after 10 days, you have a pretty strong signal. If it just dips and then recovers, that's one thing. Now, we have a peculiarity with the yield curve right now. It's steepening at the long end. 10 to 30 years is steep steepening. That's interesting. What that tells me is that there's still time for the Fed to avert recession by taking this threat immediately seriously and lowering rates. Now, one other nuance that I think is really important is, is an inverted yield curve a predictor of recession or is it a creator of recessions? I would argue it's a creator of recessions. If the long end is lower than the short end, then basically the bond market, which the 10-year yield is set by market forces, by the invisible hand of the marketplace, and if the 10-year yield is lower than short rates, basically the 10-year yield is saying people are willing to lend money at very low rates, and people aren't happy to borrow money at much above that. All right? That's interesting. Now, pair that with a short rate that's higher, and basically you're saying central bank is being way too tight in an environment where the market is telling you what the fair rate is. So when the yield curve becomes massively steep, then the central bank is being too easy. And when it's inverting, the central bank is being too tight. And that's where we are now. So the bond market is, is um, uh, telling uh, the U.S. Fed to uh, cut rates by 50, 75 basis points now. If, it, if they cut it in June and they cut it again in July and again in September, we're there. And in that circumstance, I think we avert a recession uh, because the long end of the curve says there's still time. Now, I don't know that I'm interpreting that correctly, but that's the way so I interpret Rob, it. So, um, Rob, one thing that an investor who's prospectively worried about a recession might do is pile into something that's considered safe, like utilities or low volatility stocks or consumer staples. But one thing that you've been pretty vocal about in the last couple of months is that most factors that people invest in, and factors being like growth, momentum, low volatility, basically people always implicitly have a factor bias, are extremely expensive by historical uh, measures. What does that mean for 
where people can hide yeah. out if they actually are worried? Uh, and what does it mean for prospective returns if nothing bad happens? Well, back to one of the earlier parts of the question, the, I think that long treasuries are still something of a safe haven for now. Now, if deficit spending gets out of hand, and if that eventually triggers inflation... Uh, 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 Rob, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, when you said if deficit spending gets out of hand and Jim's eyebrows raised, th there's some belief that deficit spending is already getting out of hand. <laughs> well, also, does it matter? I mean, yeah, it is already out of hand. The Wall Street Journal... Uh, the journal tells you what it's going to publish and then asks you to buy the $4 paper the day after it's in the, on the web. Anyway, the Wall Street Journal has told us of that uh, Congress and the people who elect congressmen, you and me, have stopped caring about the, uh, the state of the public credit and that uh, in any case, uh, by observation, uh, there is no connection between the things that matter, like mortgage rates on the one hand, or the stock market on the other, and against, the, that is against the uh, the state of the Treasury's finances. So uh, does it matter at all? I mean... The short answer is it doesn't matter until it does. John Malden put it well when he said that when you're creating a deficit spending induced crisis, things go along great until, bang, you hit the wall. Um, Reciprocal reciprocally, uh, uh, as in the film Thelma and Louise, they didn't go uh, tumbling into the canyon until they uh, went past the lip of the canyon. <laughs> so there was no drop until there was a drop. The, the same thing can happen when it comes to financial crises. The same thing happened in 08. Um, the subprime credit situation was, quote, well-contained, close quote, until it busted the system. So I think when we're looking for safe havens, one is diversification. Another is markets that tend to have, see the most inflows during times of crisis. And for now, long treasuries would fit that bill, just for now. And defensive strategies where you take risk off can also make sense. Now, taking risk off when it comes to low vol strategies not so sure. Low vol strategies, uh, low vol stocks aren't the value stocks anymore. The growth stocks are the low vol stocks. The high beta stocks are often the value stocks. So with low vol, you're paying a premium. Now, if the goal in low vol is to have less downside risk in a recession or a bear market, uh, how are you going to have less downside risk if your starting point is a 20% premium to the market? One of the things that troubles me about the multi-factor arena, and we offer a multi-factor product, but uh, the multi-factor arena broadly claims to have value as one of the factors that they use. But value just gets overwhelmed by the fact that momentum is anti-value, quality is anti-value, and for now, low volatility is anti-value. So if all of the factors are anti-value except for value itself, you wind up with a portfolio that's priced at a stark premium to the market. There are some multi-factor strategies out there that are 20 25% more expensive than the S&P 500 in terms of valuation multiples. How on earth are you going to have less downside risk if you're paying a 20% premium to the market? If that premium evaporates, the low beta will... We've also you. been in a bull market since March 9th of 2009, and being in a bull market for 10-plus years is kind of anti-value as well. Well, that's, that's for sure. That frames and shapes people's expectations. So people embrace low vol thinking, okay, well, I want to continue participating in a bull market, but I want to have a nod towards defensiveness. Well, the result of that is that low volatility, low beta stocks have been bid up. They now priced at a premium to the market. So watch out. Quality has been bid up. It's trading at a higher premium relative to the market than historic norms. When high-quality stocks, high-profit margin stocks, are priced 20 or 30 percent rich, low quality, that's a bargain. When they're priced twice the price of low-margin, low-quality stocks, that's not a bargain. You're paying a premium that reflects more or less the best thing that could possibly happen to these companies. Priced for perfection is the term that people often apply to that. Rob, could you, uh, in the few minutes remaining to us, could you tell us what you think about the future of passive investing, specifically with respect to the S&P 500? That's one question. And the second is uh, what you think of 
bond indexation, and I ask you specifically to home in on the seeming paradox to the civilian not involved in the business professionally, that with indexed equity investing, you buy more and more of what's big and popular. And with bond index investing, you buy more and more of what is encumbered and leveraged. And why should either of these stratagems exactly. deliver value and results over the long term? Well, firstly, the reason that indexing has taken off is that active management depends on a losing active manager to fund the successes of the winners. What do I mean by that? If you buy the entire stock market, you're buying a cap-weighted market. If you take the indexes out of that market, you're left with the same portfolio. And that same portfolio is divided up among various active players. So if I'm winning with my equity strategies, somebody's got to be a loser on the other side of the trade. Now, as in poker, if you're playing poker and you don't know who the sucker is, you're it. In active management, if you don't know who's the loser on the other side of your trade, chances are you're a loser. Watch out. So that's the best argument for indexing. The best argument against is that the more expensive the company is, the bigger your allocation to it. Why on earth would you want to do that? We wrote a paper with Harry Markowitz demonstrating that pricing error uh, can be the source of the value effect and of the size effect, that the fact that some stocks are overpriced and some are underpriced relative to what the future has in store, never mind relative to the market, but relative to what the future has in store, there are some stocks that are destined to perform badly, you're overweight those. Some stocks that are destined to perform well, you're underweight those with cap weighting. So you're assuredly overweight the overvalued companies. And what we demonstrated was that if you break the link between the price of a stock and its weight in the portfolio, which Fundamental Index does, you have a structural alpha of uh, not quite 2% per year. That's pretty cool. Now, on the bond side, it's worse. On the bond side, the more an index invests, excuse me, let me rephrase that, the borrowers who are most eager to take on more debt, you are required as an indexer to fund that, to offer them the additional debt. So your portfolio is dominated by the borrowers with the greatest appetite for debt. Why on earth would you want to do that? It makes no sense at all. And in bonds, in fact, the average active manager wins. Now, why? how could the average active manager win? win? Only if there are, are, is somebody on the other side of their trade who is losing. The who indexer. Might that What's that? The indexers. Well, the indexers are just matching the market. So the indexers will have performance ah. that roughly matches the market. But the active manager beats the market. Most active managers beat the market. And the reason they beat the market is that you have large classes of investors who are not motivated by a desire to buy bargains. Central banks, they buy assets for non-economic reasons. Banks and insurance companies have statutory capital requirements that haircut certain categories of bonds, meaning that they're going to shun those categories even if they're bargains. So as long as you have major players who have non-economic interests, you're going to create a profit for those who have that profit motive. All right. Well, Rob, thank you for that and for being with us. And uh, I don't know, I, I, there are so many thoughts and uh, so many ideas, but I'm going to reduce this, uh, I hope, uh, fairly to two main concepts. First and foremost, happy Father's Day. And secondly, buy Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> the readers of the readers of the readers of grants are going to know something more about Argentina than they knew uh, last week. That's all I'm going to say about that because we don't tip our hand to the the good people who listen only. But they they may subscribe if they like. Hey, by the way, have we had a commercial yet, Eric? No. Okay. Subscribe to Grants Interest Rate Observer and visit the website of Research Affiliates. How's that, Rob? That's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, yeah, lovely to be with you, Rob. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Until next time, this is Jim Grant on behalf of The Current Yield.